I work for a company called Zaner. Uh, we are fabricators. Uh, we do fabrication, engineering, and installation. So we work across the full length of projects. And we're fortunate to work on a lot of exciting projects with, with many of you. Um, our speciality is sheet metal, typically exteriors, enclosures, uh, the complex exterior of the building that has tight tolerances, a lot of uh, you know, visual intrigue, as well as a lot of uh, tight and uh, tricky, tricky elements to deliver. So the last time I was here, I talked about file to the machine and how there's difficulties in delivering your designs. Uh, all the tools we've seen today are super exciting. But all of those workflows will die if you don't think about where it goes afterward. And so what I showed here on the last time was this is the, the control computer for our punching machine. And I, you know, the, the punchline was that the, there's a portion of the paint that's actually worn away from interacting with it in a, uh, in a certain way. And so if you're, if you're able to generate thousands and tens of thousands of unique files, but it comes here and it ends up in an interface like that, it's likely not going to make it through. So the punching machine and digital fabrication in general has promised us no penalty for variation, right? The machine itself doesn't care if the triangle is this way or that way, if your pattern is one way or another, uh, it should be able to, to provide us with that. But there's always a disconnect between parties. Uh, oftentimes the design team has never met or spoken with the person who's gonna be operating that machine. They'll understand the implications of some of your design decisions up front. So the project I spoke about before was trying to bridge these groups together, going all the way upstream, working with, uh, HKS and HKS line to tailor the design information in a format that would be delivered more, uh, more successfully later downstream to the actual manufacturers. And on this project, we actually worked all the way down with the machine manufacturers themselves, got access to their API, and was able to program in this, the, the machine operation software in a similar way that you would with Grasshopper and whatnot. And so it was that kind of bridging of roles. And then the, the lines above here are, are important to look at where on most of the times as projects progress, you've got your computational tools start to dwindle and die off as you work your way towards the field, while your costs uh, start to skyrocket. So the good news, uh, LA Stadium, this is the, the image that I left Ruby with back five years ago. And at that point, we were starting to make panels. There's 37,000 unique panels on this project. And at that point, we had made 1,000, installed zero. So it was sort of like, well, let's hope it works. Good news is it worked. Uh, we delivered 37,000 unique panels, th sorry, 35,000 unique panels. We had a couple of remakes just because panels got lost, but uh, we, we had sort of a really beautiful coordination by bringing all those different roles and groups together. And so ta-da, mass customization, case closed, we've got it. So it's there as long as you bring all the relevant parties together and you have that conversation early. There's the sofa. So in a similar vein, uh, the last few years we've been working on unifying roles again, but this time going further downstream. And so if there's a gap between your manufacturing and your design, there's a massive void if between your design and your installation on site. The tools you have out there are string levels, you know, things that the Egyptians were using. And so while we have complex tools and uh, we can come up with really innovative strategies, right now it's paired with conventional delivery. That is just, it's a, it's a, a, a match that's made for disaster. Uh, if we zoom in on that red line, why does the cost get expensive? This is sort of looking at Zaner specifically, uh, but if you're early on in a process, you know, and you're working in the sort of engineering zone, your costs are pretty small, right? Changing the model, pushing things around, it's more or less free, it costs you time. If you jump into the shop, now all of a sudden we have material, we have time on the machines, we have scheduling, we have labor, we have uh, crating, we have all this information and all this, this time and energy that's invested in these parts. You change it there and you're, you're 10x to 100x. You change it in the field after we've shipped a prefabricated unit that has been made on extremely extensive machines with, with craftspeople, you might be at a thousand X, you know, if you're renting equipment and all the insurance, everything that goes on in site. So there's a huge problem here where we've got, we've got such huge risk at the end with not a lot of tools to deal with that risk. So I'm going to talk about an unknown project here, but I thought it'd be, it's, it's nice to be, it's nice to be after Pablo. Um, you know, working with architects upstream is, is the way we prefer to work, getting involved as early as possible. Uh, with Heatherwick, we were really fortunate to be uh, involved early on through design assist and working through mockups and prototypes and getting really deep into the modeling portion for delivering this. And so the scope of work we did on this, and I'm going to use this project as an example of, of what sort of the trajectory it sent us off on. There's a lot of survey and a lot of field work that was done on this project that has led to the tools, which I'll, I'll wrap up with. But the two scopes of work we had on this project were the perimeter bolt nose here. Uh, so this is 14 gauge stainless steel, these clear story ribbons that uh, aligned with the glazing units, and then these nodes that kind of uh, are all the sort of self-resolving elements of, of the project. 
So uh, business as usual for us, we model everything. We talk to the, the shop. We have a really tight feedback loop between the, the artisans who are working with the material and the way we model it. We embed all that information via parametric modeling. Uh, parametric production is the terms we use uh, in, in, uh, at Zaner, where we're collecting information about material, about labor rates, about time, about schedule, embedding that all into uh, our models to deliver parts like this. And then we cut them out, we form them, we uh, engineer the tooling, we, we do empirical testing to make sure the material is gonna behave the way we expect. We take that back to the model and make sure that our models are actually fabricatable. We use parametric jigs as well. You know, so this is a interchangeable jig where things slide back and forth. So with two pieces of information, the, the craftspeople can actually go through and validate that, that part's gonna be just what you expect. And so in the shop, we've got great control over the geometry. We model things in multiple orientations. We model everything up to shipping, fitting on trucks, delivering those trucks sequenced and ready to install. So that, that's, that's kind of business usual for us. We've 30 plus years, 50 projects at once, doing wild and interesting geometry. So the sort of bits to Adam's part, we have, we have covered quite well. The part that it, we've been really digging in and two members of my team are here, which we can, we'll, we'll be here for the hackathon to chat more about, is how do we take that file to the field? The file to the machine, we've got pretty well solved. But unfortunately, all the benefits of prefabrication disappear if you don't coordinate it on site, because now you've invested a lot of money and a lot of time into these parts that are not mutable. So they show up on site, you can't cut them, you can't grind them, you can't adjust them. So you better have that coordinated well. And this is what we're dealing with, right? So we're literally mountain climbing and trying to pull dimensions and trying to, to uh, coordinate pieces being installed uh, on a project like such. And then there's a lot of different parties that come together, a lot of disparate tolerances and not a lot of coordination that happens. And so it's nice to see uh, platforms that bring all this different disparate data together, but we need to integrate people further down the stream and further down the line in order to kind of deliver that successfully. And then there's, there's a, a, a level of quality that's really uh, important to us, but also obviously to all the owners and designers and everybody else that is really hard to attain, right? When you've got steel that can be plus or minus three, four inches different directions, and you want to have a half inch joint around that, which you're kind of seeing here. So the way on site, you typically uh, interact and, and gather information. The measuring tape is the, the default one, but oftentimes the total station where you've got a measuring device, you've got a survey target or a retroflector that's giving you a point in space, you're collecting information. And what that normally looks like is either layout points or reference points that the surveyor comes out and plots that for you. Then you use that as reference to lay things out or it's a comparison about what's been built versus what should have been built, which is the right-hand side, which is typically a PDF report, a stack of drawings and dead data. The trouble with both of those approaches is that the job sites are, are really volatile. There's huge pressure to deliver on site. The people who are actually building and uh, you know, putting these parts in position are asked to do the, the uh, impossible, which is deliver a schedule with, you know, to uh, install these, these unique pieces on a site like this where you've got pits and holes and bulldozers and you've got all these things in your way. And so while you might have a reference mark, you may have to do several offsets and go around things. And every time you do that, you, you incur more error and, um, and oftentimes the, the sort of dimensional drift can happen as your tolerances stack up. And the majority of communication uh, that happens, uh, and this is a funny photo that was captured by my super where this is Mark Garner, one of our, uh, our craftspeople on the roof calling me as he's making this drawing to try and figure out what the heck was going on. And so he's transcribing some 200 measurements for me from you know, a laser measuring down. I'm trying to interpret what he's seen, um, comparing against the model doesn't match up. I sent him something he looks at and he's like, that oh, doesn't make sense. And so we go back and forth and back and forth trying to deliver these, these really complex buildings. Uh, on the uh, clear story elements here, and we're gonna talk explicitly about how we installed these ones. Our, our units mounted to the glazing units. So our positioning was, was really dependent on their success. They had plus or minus three inches uh, in the back of the, of the units on the jack bolts. And then we mounted to these clear story brackets using survey points and coordinating names. So it's not easy to, to determine where things are. As this building was, was being loaded, it was changing shape. As the sun hits it, it stretches and grows. And so this building is a really active thing. So as you're surveying it, it might be surveyed many, many times. So if you're working in PDFs and you're working with, with a, a, um, a low fidelity version of the data, then you're gonna be having all this overhead to review it. So this is you know, the, the overall uh, positioning in elevation. So I'm color coding them here, looking at how these things change. 
So every bracket's going up and down. And so all of your directives for how you install it needs to, to basically respond to this, this variability. If you do it via PDF, then you're looking at this, you're calling somebody, you're trying to get that information to them, you're doing it 10,000 times. Instead, we coordinated all that point data, brought it in raw from the total station. And so instead of them taking the point data on an SD card, making a report, sending me a PDF, we requested they just send me the, the point data directly, plot it in. Uh, and when you have it plotted and you have data and you've got automation, then you can start doing a lot of other things. Chuan uh, and Robert were helpful and they provided me all the deflection data for the, the units. We could also include future deflection. And so we could say, okay, the roof is, has this much load right now. It's likely going to go further. So we need to set our units higher so it lands in the right place. A solution that's really only possible if you're in a modeling world and you're interacting with data. Uh, the result of that was a pretty simple directive. Uh, before the units flew up in the air, we provided them with a dimension for the jack bolt based on that survey data, based on that projected uh, deflection. The units flew up into the sky and they magically landed exactly plumb just where they should be. Um, it was a good, a, a good process validation that I saw that they actually wrote my values on the back of every anchor. The first bay they didn't trust it was going to work, but uh, after they installed the first one in 40 minutes and projected three days, then all of a sudden they wouldn't hang unless we provided them with that data. So it, it proved that we could, if we think about survey and collecting information and get a feedback loop back to the field, we can deliver pretty astounding results, uh, faster, safer, less time up on the roof. Uh, and this is actually the, the rough set of these units. Here's the final. This building was particularly tricky because everything was self-resolving. You know, one, one edge of the bay impacted the next, which impacted the next and the next and the next. And so there's nowhere to hide. You know, some buildings you can just like grow it a little bit or cut off the edge. There's nowhere to do that here. And so this coordination was, was incredibly important. And we, we were uh, via this collaboration with the surveyors, we were able to, to do this quite well. But this feedback loop is, is not ideal. So if, if you kind of follow the, the path here from survey, crews installing parts, that survey information got taken to an SD card, made to a PDF, came back around, and that's the typical way. It still happened as, as data too. And all the tools that I had built for deflecting and reviewing all the parts and pieces really only sped up that last bit, which in reality, what we wanted was why, why couldn't I just talk right across and just, just uh, you know, short circuit that whole loop, especially when the people who were involved in that conversation, when there were problems, were scattered across the globe. It's really hard. The, the feedback loop is really long. And so we were constantly having to um, you know, delay installation to have conversations. And so there's still a big, a big problem with that feedback loop, even though it, it is possible. I'm going to zoom through this because I think I'm running short on time. But um, if we look at sort of construction as a, a control system, you know, the target is the green line. Survey happens periodically. And in between, all hell breaks loose and, and construction happens. And the air starts to accumulate, goes further and further and further out. And eventually, typically uh, for us, the steel or the concrete or something is so far out, but so big that it's not moving. And so then the, the people come to us and say, well, we can't move the steel, so what are you gonna do? We're forced to then reconcile that change and figure out how we can, with our prefabricated parts, still, design, you know, still fit to things that are in the field. Well, the tools we've been building is trying to do is treat it more like a typical control system where you're getting you know, faster feedback, you're getting quicker review, you're embedding some knowledge into that. And so you're staying close to that target as you work. There were two things we had to do to make that work. One was getting the information from the total station or from the site or whatever your sensor is back to the model faster. And so we're using a, a like a total station here and we're broadcasting the survey data uh, to the model directly. So once we had that, that sort of information directly in the model, we could do that thing that I was doing uh, on, the, on the, the, the Google project um, in real time. The other thing is, once it's in the model, you still need to have everybody, all the stakeholders review it, and you need to have uh, intelligence to on how to interpret that data. So the first part, broadcast the data, and then get it to a model where everybody can review it. The second part came working with a company called Z, and they do uh, compression algorithms to get large data sets into the cloud. And so from the browser, we can load this model, uh, and we started to build up tools. Once the data is in there, how do we interpret it? The dream being to provide basically yeah, in situ, in real time directives for how to correct your positioning. So the way this works is we continue to sample, we take those measurements, those things are, are plotted in the model compared against a target plane. And it's not just a XYZ global coordinate system, it's actually to a tailored plane. So it's giving you relevant information for how you need to move. So it's not giving you some arbitrary vector, it's telling you exactly how you need to adjust to hit a certain plane. 
a couple of projects that we've deployed this on. Uh, this is one that's actually active right now. The steel, once again, was close, but not quite. Um, we validated that via scanning, looking at uh, the scan versus the, the target model. They don't fit up. So your options are what? You ask the steel manufacturers to take these pipes down, take them back to their factory, re-roll them, and then bring them back. It just doesn't happen, right? It's not a realistic thing. So instead, we started doing what we were even calling rec reconciliation modeling. So how do we take our parts and actually fit them and test fit them against the, the uh, target model? Bringing this back, there's lots of different solutions. Once you de depart from it being binary, is it the theoretical, is it not? Then we can start to do some solving. And so we can find a best fit example for how we can take our parts and reconcile them against the real world. Pretty exciting, right? If you're, if you're doing this in, you know, in, uh, in real life, you might take the parts up there, fit them, see how they fit, go back and adjust them, go back and adjust them. But the parts are big, you know, this required a lot of welding. And so it's not really feasible to do that uh, many times, right? But if we're doing this in the model, we can do it 10,000 times and find a perfect fit that reduces uh, what, you know, the, the total potential error and also finds the best solution aesthetically, whether that's tangencies or something you're looking at. Uh, what this looks like from the, the model that we mentioned is now we've, we've come up with an optimized solution, but how do you get that information to the field? Well, so that's where we started deploying the browser-based model and that survey link, uh, or the total station tie, which we've been calling survey link. So now we have all these individual planes, we go out there, we use a prism, we locate things per that model. It is achievable because it's now been fitted to the real world. They went through then and welded the studs on, which we'll, we'll zoom through. The second part of this was locating the ends. So knowing your adjustment and how to coordinate that and how to use your tolerance is a, is a tricky thing. But here we can come up with a very specialized solution that's been optimized and then deliver it to a very high tolerance in the field. You can see here it in action. So. Um, each of these parts were installed without a measuring tape, right? You plug these two uh, prisms on the two ends, you compare your position uh, in real time as you're working, it drives it into position against your model, and then you're done. The proof of it is that all the, all the parts fit. These are all prefabricated, so we're not field measuring anything. Uh, all of our joints worked out, everything maps to that reconciled model. So it is achievable, it just takes a lot more coordination downstream and understanding that feedback loop is, is really critical. Was that a one-off solution? No, uh, we, another project that's had to be withheld, but this has worked out really well on geometry that's bananas, that like just traditional tools don't work, right? Like there's not a single plum or level piece in this entire project. Each of the units had a lot of adjustability that's hard to explain to somebody in the field and how to pitch something in a compound rotation. If you ever try to explain how to, how to do such a thing, it's challenging, especially over the phone. So instead we used the, the same uh, survey link model and instead of using, uh, you know, complex directives, we send a single link, they use that link, they measure the, the points, they shift them into position. And because it's automated, you can, you can measure this two, 300 times as you're moving into position. So you get better and better quality. Once again, proof of this one, fins all went up, skins all fit up, joints uh, remained intact. Then we did some quality, quality control scans to verify. We were able to hit extremely tight tolerances with our installed parts against our target. Skins fit and uh, Overall, it's, it's an ex exciting future, getting the field involved with computational tools, getting solvers downstream, solving some of the problems that are the most expensive uh, in a project and also the most risky. And so uh, the consequence of, of not coordinating that is that things get fit differently than you expect. Your performance is different. Your aesthetics are different. The costs are different. Your schedule is busted. Things are more expensive. So uh, in some ways, I feel like the field is actually the most ripe for delivering these new tools, especially you know, tools that bring different data sets together. And uh, that's what we've been trying to do and I'm happy to continue chatting about it. Thanks.